like to open up by reading Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12. For it have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I'd like to just turn across into Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 15. For this reason too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists amongst you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of your, his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which brought about in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and that every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, has put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over the things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's just pray. And Father, I thank you that we find so clearly that the cry of your heart is that we have personal revelation of you. And that, Lord, there is teaching of man, there is the wisdom of man, but there's also the wisdom and revelation of God. And I thank you that the eyes of our heart can be opened to see the true light, the true King of glory. That we might stand before you with hands lifted up in adoration. And Lord, you say, those who look to you shall be radiant. Lord, I thank you that the light of your presence can transform us from glory to glory. That you are truly glorified. You are the King of glory. Lord, we lift our face before you. And our hands in adoration. And our hearts in worship. And we just bow down. And say, you are God. There is no one else. And we worship and adore you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'd like to speak on the whole realm of revelation. We've often taken this understanding of revelation and relegated it to the book of Revelation and tended to talk it in the end times context of um, the events that are about to take place. I'd like to talk about it, about a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Paul, in his own conversion, said that that's how he came to know God, was through a personal revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's mostly very helpful for us as Christians is to find out how did he get converted. Um, I have just was just in Israel and Egypt, and I was on the road to Damascus, actually, on the Golan Heights, looking over this area. We find here in Acts chapter 9, when Saul was breathing threats and murders against the disciples of Jesus Christ, he went to the high priest and asked for letters for him in the synagogues at Damascus so that he might uh, find anyone belonging to the way, men and women, and bring them bound to Jerusalem. And it came about, in verse 3, he was journeyed, and he de approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a loud voice, sorry, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and enter the city, and it shall be told to you what you must, must do. So we find here, how did he get converted? A bright light from, not a strobe light or a church light, a bright light from heaven, shone down upon him, blinded by the light, and then he realizes that the person he's speaking to is Jesus Christ himself, who he's been persecuting. And what an incredible, incredible way to come to know God. I find that the cost, you see, was very, very high. Uh, he had no idea, really, what the Lord had for him. Having been wholeheartedly against the church, God was going to turn this man around to be wholeheartedly for him. You know that God loves to get people who are wholehearted. 
says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that the heart is the wellsprings of life. And so I find that it's very, very key. The eyes of our heart are to be open to have a revelation. The key to revelation is from the heart. Many of us in the Western world live out of the intellect. We live out of a Greek mindset where our minds are continually trying to ascertain and understand the word of God, but very little of it is actually through personal revelation. Yet the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians, what is it, 14, if we come to church, bring a psalm, a hymn, a revelation, a tongue, prophecy. He said, I'd rather that I spoke by revelation. It's 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, that you might be edified. The question is, what are we having a revelation of? Here, Paul had a personal revelation of God shining down from heaven and transforming him. As you look through the, we'll look through some New Testament examples, but also into the Old Testament. When we look in the Old Testament, this particular form of revelation became quite normal. Um, we find in uh, so Genesis just have a quick look at my notes here. Genesis 28, verse 12. Jacob uh, saw a ladder going into heaven. He had what was called an open heaven. The angels of God were ascending and descending from the throne room down onto earth. And that is an amazing uh, concept that here men in the Old Testament were having personal revelation of the kingdom of heaven on earth. We find also Moses, of course, had the radiance of God's glory come down in Exodus 34, verses 33 to 35. And as that radiance came, he would speak to the Lord. As the glory of God would descend from heaven onto earth, he would begin to speak to him. And the glory of God caused the transformation in Moses' spirit, such that it began to radiate out upon his physical countenance, and the light of God's presence was beginning to be seen. Now in the New Testament, it talks about that we should be lights of the world, that the light of God should be seen, you know what I mean, upon us, and that we should not hide the light that's within us. Now how would you like to have such light that your actual face was so bright you had to put a veil over it? How many would just like to put a veil over your face anyhow? <laughs> well, some people do. It's a black one, unfortunately. But we'd like to actually see an open radiance of God's glory coming out of a person's countenance. In Isaiah 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Upon who? Hello, Katie. I was just looking. <laughs> um, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And what an awesome thought, isn't it? Transform from glory to glory. Isn't the New Testament saying when the Spirit of God comes, it's to enable us to be transformed from glory to glory. But to be transformed from glory to glory, you have to see it. Does that make any sense? So what does the glory of God look like? How on earth could the glory of God descend onto earth? And how on earth could people actually start to get caught up into the glory realm? We go through into Isaiah, Isaiah 6 verses 1 to 8. Now Isaiah said the glory of the Lord came and began to train, filled the temple. And we find the angelic host who surround the throne started covering their face. And what was coming forth from the glory of God was such holiness that they were, they were unable almost to look upon it. But Isaiah had the ability as man created the image of God to look upon the holiness of God. See, there is the fruit of the Spirit, love and peace and joy. This is the outer court. This is the waves of his presence. But the scriptures say we have access into the holy of holies. That the veil has been torn through the new order of Melchizedek the veil has been torn into the holy place and that we can actually come boldly into the throne of grace. As I went in, in my own personal experience, what struck me was the purity and holiness of Christ. For a person who understands what it is not to be pure and have lost purity and lost innocence, to stand in the presence of Jesus, my entire person was being transformed by that radiant purity. Now, many times I'd seen people try and live pure lives, and how many have failed at some stage along the line there? How many as Christians have kind of failed a few times since, you know what I mean? Well, that just means that we're saved by grace. It's a throne of... We can come into the throne of grace. And it's his purity. It's his holiness that transforms us. And, we, and many people strive, I find a lot of people strive to be holy and pure. 
and it's a lot of flesh, a lot of their own strength. The purity and holiness of God I've found is imparted unto me when I remain in his presence. When I actually come into his presence. And here Isaiah sees the holiness of God. He then goes, I'm undone. I'm, I'm undone. I'm unclean. The response from God is, angels, take a burning coal, clean that man. So when you come into the presence of God and you come in an act of humility and honesty about your sin, what God does makes you clean. See, many people are afraid to come into the light because their deeds are exposed that are evil. But God's choice for mankind is to continually come into the light and expose the deeds of darkness. That the light of God's presence would dispel the darkness and sin and through his precious blood could wash us as white as snow. We enter only through the veil through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so here, Isaiah then has an incredible call from God, um, who shall go? See, through the revelation of the holiness of God, through the revelation of the glory of God came the commissioning. God says, many are called, but few are chosen. He offered, he said, well, who's going to go for us? Who's going to go out and tell the world? He said, Lord, here I am, send me. And so many people say, I'd love to go to heaven. I'd love to have revelation of God. I say, are you willing to pay the price of what the call might be? Much is given, much is required. There is a great price behind the anointing of God. God doesn't just reveal himself for the sake of revealing himself. He reveals himself for people to actually see his glory and to be changed by that. Changed from glory to glory. You're fairly quiet. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, he was in exile. And what happens right now prophetically, I think God's speaking a lot through the book of Ezekiel. It says, as it was in Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, he had an open heaven above him. He began to see the radiance, as you read through it, the glory and radiance of God. It says it was like burning fire. There was wheels within wheels. A rainbow like Jasper like, was, was covering the, the throne of God. And he saw something like the Son of God, the Son of Man, appear to him with the glory of his presence shining. You understand these are men in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. <laughs> well, I think we'd like to see a little bit of that just in the New Covenant, wouldn't we? It goes on and says in Ezekiel 8, 1 to 3, that he was caught up between heaven and earth. In Ezekiel 11, verses 1 and 24, the Spirit lifted him up into the heavenly, into the heavenly realm. In, in Ezekiel 43, it says, The earth shone with the glory of God, and the Spirit of God came in. The glory of God came in through the eastern gate. As it began to fill the temple, the presence of God filled the temple. The eastern gate is what's called the beautiful gate or the golden gate. It is the gate which is a double gate, which leads from the Garden Gethsemane. You look up to it, and it's the entry point into what was the old Temple Mound. Having been in Israel just recently, the Mount of Olives stays above the city, or where the temple was. Mount of Olives comes down, which is now actually a grave site where they bury the dead, and down at the base of this valley is called the Garden of Gethsemane. As you look up, you find the Golden Gate. Fabulous place. Now, the Muslims believe that, because um, they've understood the scriptures, that it says the Messiah will come through that gate and, and free the children of Israel and Jerusalem. So they have walled up that gate. It's sealed up. They've put spotlights and machine guns there so they can stop any Messiah coming. They've also, because they know that a Messiah or a rabbi would defile himself by walking through a graveyard, have buried all their dead all around the base of the Golden Gate. They failed to realize that 2,000 years ago, the King of Glory did walk through those gates. And the glory of God came into the temple. In Ezekiel 47, the prophet Ezekiel saw a river coming out with healing in it, which went out to the nations. That river has already been released. When he comes back again, which he will come, he'll touch down on that Mount of Olives. This trouble, this time it'll split the mountain. And I don't think any guard or any concrete or any bricks are going to stop him walking through the gate. Because as he can walk through, like the matrix, he can walk through into his world is more real than this. He walked through wars when he revealed himself to his disciples. His presence walks straight through this natural realm, which we think is real, but his kingdom is more real. This will pass away. All of this will pass away. There is a new heaven and new earth. This old earth and heaven will pass away. How on earth to get onto all that? Anyhow, 
The glory of the Lord. Daniel 7, verses 1 to 2. Daniel had visions of God in his bed when he wrote them. He began to have literally open heaven stuff. As you read through into Daniel, you find that he actually saw Jesus um, and he saw the Father. He saw the Father, the Ancient of Days, sitting upon the throne, and his throne was on fire. There's a river of fire coming from beneath him, angels all around him. And we find here that Jesus is then brought in the cloud, one like the Son of Man was brought before the Father. And he was brought before the Ancient of Days. He was given dominion and authority and a kingdom, and his kingdom will not pass away. There's a great picture of seeing the Father and the Son in the Old Testament is in Daniel chapter 7. For any Jews have difficulty with understanding that Christ is the Messiah, because he is Yeshua HaMashiach. I'd like to move on, because I've run out of time already, I haven't even started. <laughs> in the New Testament we find Nathaniel was the first person to uh, be spoken of by Jesus to have an open heaven above him. In John chapter 1, it's very fascinating, this particular passage is often given to the Apostle Peter, but here in, in John chapter 1, um, in verse 39, 49, Nathanael answered Jesus saying, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. You are what? You are the son of God. Now, how many relegated that to Peter? You know what I mean? <laughs> you might be fascinated that Martha also knew that he was the son of God. When you read about the... Um, we get caught up trying to say, well, let's all be Marys and not be Marthas. Well, there's a lot of people who are just downright lazy in the church. Too busy running around being so spiritual and no use to anyone else, practically. Sorry, but read, read in the Gospel of John about Lazarus' resurrection. You'll find out who, Jesus said, who am I? Who do you think I am? He said, you're the son of God. There we are. That was, how would you like to be a Martha and actually reveal it was the son of God? She even then turned around and said um, to Mary, uh, Ma Jesus is looking for you. The master is looking for you. That's, tr that's not true. He wasn't. He was going to go and raise Lazarus from the dead. So this dear woman in her own humility incorporated Mary into the revelation of the dead being raised. <laughs> she thought about other people other than herself. We must decrease and he must increase. Church right now has got it completely around the backwards. Everyone else is trying to increase and they forget about the name of Jesus. <laughs> Anyhow, where are we? We're in church, praise God. <laughs> and here Jesus said to Nathanael, because in verse 50, because you said that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe greater things shall, than these things. And he said to Nathanael, truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Open heaven again. Open heaven. Now, no one told me when I got saved that I wasn't allowed to go back there. So I had what was called a life after death experience where I was caught up into what was called the third heaven. When we have a read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, and we can start in verse 1, because it's, Paul said, Boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable. I'll go into visions and revelations of the Lord. Go on to what? Visions and revelations. Not one. Visions and revelations of who? The Lord. Okay, let's see where he sees them. It says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or out of the body, but God knows that such a man was caught up into the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, God knows, was caught up into paradise. Here's an awesome thought, isn't it? Here's Paul, he's converted by a radiance of light coming down from heaven onto earth. He's now talking about visions and revelations of being taken up into paradise, into the third heaven. You're all very quiet again. He's what? He's caught up. Understand Ezekiel had this. Understand the Old Testament prophets were caught up into the throne room. Do you understand that Isaiah was in the throne room of God? Here we've got New Testament people talking about having open heaven and being caught up into the third heaven. Does that make any sense? I've got no time, so I'm going to race through some stuff. Book of Revelations. Verse 1. Chapter 1. A revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Not a revelation of John, not a revelation of Patmos, not a revelation of anything else, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And what does he see? It says, in the spirit, in verse 10, on the Lord's day, I heard a loud voice like a trumpet, and he was taken up into a realm where he saw Jesus Christ standing in white robes. Robes reached his feet, his head and his hair were white like wool like snow. His face shone like the sun in full strength. And he held, what, seven stars? And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And he said, don't be afraid. I was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who has John seen? And I've had the privilege to be on this island of Patmos. Who has he seen? Jesus Christ in his glorified risen form. That's fun, isn't it? He then goes on from chapter 2 to chapter 3. He gets a revelation of the condition of the church from a heavenly realm. How many know people got a, an understanding of the church from an earthly realm? <laughs> but there's a difference when God looks at the church from the heavenly realm. He always sees good things in it. If you only hear people saying bad things about the church, they're obviously not speaking from a heavenly realm. How many know there are problems with the church? Be honest. How many know there's problems with me? The reality is God loves people. God loves the church. Having seen all this, in chapter 4 of Revelations, after these things, I looked and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. The first voice that I heard was one like the sound of the trumpet uh, speaking to me. He said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, one seated upon the throne. Okay. who has he seen he's just seen Jesus Christ glorified he's seen the condition from that heavenly realm because it says we're to be seated in heavenly places remember that when we get saved by grace Ephesians saved by grace and seated in heavenly places don't wait until you die to go there starts to see what an open door into the throne room he then taken up to see the Father, to see the, the awesome presence of God. This doesn't stop. Understanding we've got 22 chapters of this. He goes on and continues to see the angels of the Lord. He then sees the multitudes of people who have been saved out of the tribulation in Revelation chapter 7, standing with white robes, having their garments washed with the blood of Jesus, worshipping him. And goes on and we continue. I'm going to jump because I've got no goes on and says he then sees the return of Christ. He sees that Jesus Christ is coming in all his glory. He then is taken and shown in chapter 21, he's shown a new heaven and a new earth. He's actually taken to see the new heaven and new earth. How many know the new heaven and new earth are not here on earth? He said, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. Where I am, you know, so, so he's, he, his realm, there's another realm there. Quantum physics has only just figured it out. That's why they put the movie The Matrix out. They, they've figured out there's a parallel universe working in, in complete harmony right now with this known one. Guess what? We knew that. Because Jesus said, I have gone to prepare a new heaven and a new earth. Many people are waiting for this old earth to be remodeled. Do not hold your breath. <laughs> and don't waste your money. So says, behold, us are all things new. Now understand the new Jerusalem came down out of the new heaven onto the new earth, not the old one. So don't go waiting for the new Jerusalem to come down on this planet. You'll again be holding your breath. Maybe for a millennium, which you may not understand, but we'll move on. He said, I saw no, te I saw no temple because the Lord was the temple. And then he saw, said, I saw a river of life. And then the Spirit and, and, and the Lord said, come and drink freely of the river of life. Now, when I got saved, I was saved in, um, in an ambulance, praying, giving my life to God. I was then taken out of my body, taken through the pits of darkness, through Hades, and taken up into the third heaven, into the new, new earth, <laughs> paradise. Remember when Jesus died, the man next to him said, today you should be with me in paradise. What do we find in 2 Corinthians? We shall be what? In paradise, in a third heaven. Do you realize that the word caught up that Paul uses is the same word that's used in the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.17? Exactly the same Greek word. 
caught up. How many know that the rapture were going to be bodily caught up and taken up to be with him when he returns? How many believe that? Three of you. So we're finding here that Paul's saying, well, I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body, but I was caught up. I was actually raptured up into the third heaven and had revelations and visions of heaven. I think we need to spend a lot more time speaking about heaven, because that's where our home is. And if we're going to be changed by it, we need to come into that place, into the realm of glory. This is a bit redundant. We change from glory to glory by looking upon the glory. What I've found in my years of Christianity, and I've been following the law for 24 years, since 1982, I found many people when I became a Christian saw the Lord as a dead person hanging on a cross. And they spent most of their entire Christianity focused upon a dead saviour. They'd kiss the thing, have it hanging around their neck, and I have no problems with that, but he's off the cross. And all these issues were focused upon a dead person. Okay. The person I'd seen was risen and glorified. The person that converted Paul was a person who shone from heaven down and was taken up and saw the radiant glory of God. Then I found a lot of other Christians spend an incredible amount of time historically looking at Jesus in the Gospels and talking about theology about what Jesus did 2,000 years ago and arguing the toss about it. Rather than focusing upon a person who's now alive and glorified and radiant and his presence fills the heavens and he's doing the same stuff now, but he's doing it out of a risen, glorified form. He is the Son of God. <laughs> John 10, verse 7 and 9, Jesus said, I am the door of life. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, no one can come to the Father but through me. What I find when I was early, early Christian was I'd often come into the church and see the glory of God fill the church, billow out of the, into the car park, and I saw the radiance of God's glory upon people's countenances. I could actually see it. I could look upon the congregation and see who had been in the radiance of God's glory. You could literally physically look and see. Do you realize that the New Testament wasn't written for a few centuries? So what were they having? Experiences with a dead person or a risen glorified person? Let's have a quick look at Stephen in the book of Acts. Stephen was a young man who had served the tables and and literally lay down his life. Do his, his, you realize when you get full of the Holy Spirit, to come into the power of the Spirit, you've got to go through serving. Just a, it's called the wilderness. It's a quick teaching there. But it says that they couldn't cope with the wisdom and revelation that was coming from him. And in verse 15 of Acts 6, and fixing the gaze upon Stephen, all who were sitting there saw his face like the face of an angel. How many know if you're going into heavenly places and where the angels are and the glory of God is, your face and countenance might start looking angelic? It's a bit better than Nutramedics in the Avon lady. And so we moved on, and it says here they started arguing with him. So he does a whole bunch of um, apologetics and basically gives them all the revelation of theology of why Jesus is the Messiah. And then he gets to the point he's sick of that. How many sometimes get sick of just arguing the toss about theology? He just said, well, in verse... It says he tells them to stiff necked and resist the Holy Spirit. That didn't go on too well. In verse 55, then full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven. Stephen gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So here is a New Testament believer who's been serving the tables. He's moving in the power of God. He looks angelic. He's now coming in, in verse 55, he gets to the point where there's no use arguing. He just does what he normally does in his Christian walk. He sees heaven. The problem here is that he actually starts to tell them what he sees. How many know sometimes a problem when you start telling people you've seen heaven? And he said, behold, I see heaven opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At that moment, every religious demon in these Pharisees just manifested and they ran and in one impulse and stoned him to death at a place that was called the, the Sheep Gate. or the, it's, it's the gate just to the right of the, the, the Golden Gate. It's a sheep market where the shepherds used to meet and they stoned him to death. So the fact that you start seeing heaven open wide doesn't mean people will love you. Jesus was very interesting in his own walk. He went on what was called, a, he used to go away and pray alone. 
and the disciples would often not be with him, but he'd go away and pray alone. And what was incredible is that one day he decided to take them with him. We've built this into an entire theology. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus said, I only see and do and speak that which I see the Father do. And so he went off and spent time in the presence of God. And where was the Father? In heaven. And he was having the presence of God come down onto earth. Other times, I'm sure he has been taken up into the heavenly realm, caught up in the spirit, and beginning to see it. One day, he decides to take the disciples with him, Peter, James, and John, and it's in um, Matthew 17. And as they go up onto it, it says in verse 2 that his, he was transformed. His face shone like the sun, his garments became, garments became as white as light, and Moses and Elijah appeared. Peter, of course, he was thinking, let's build a monument here. <laughs> some tabernacles let's do a monument to when God turned up his glory came down I mean, you know the man loves doing that when God's presence came down once they tend to build a monument around it do you realize that God loved to move and yet to follow his spirit the Lord, Lord wants to dwell within us doesn't he he wants to dwell inside us so that we are the temple of God not some physical building that the glory of God might dwell and habitate within us abide in us so here is a transformation. I personally believe that Jesus was having that on a daily basis. Not a one-off. Daily. And at times the glory would come down, the cloud of glory would come down. I've been in a place where I've been with people who the cloud of glory has come down. You open your eyes and the whole room is full of the light of radiance of God's presence here on earth. I mean, in places where you're ruined for anything else in the church because God fills the house. No one, I was in Swindon in England and the glory of God came into this meeting. Within five minutes, there was no one standing. No one prayed for anyone. No one touched them. The presence of God just filled the house. We stood back in awe, realized that we'd seen what we could do and as, as ministers and as, as followers of Christ. We could see what God could do. In the early 90s in Hamilton, in, in the AOG, which is now called Gateway, we had waves of God's Spirit come in like a freight train. <sighs> hundreds upon hundreds of people swept under the anointing of God. People, oh, was, in those days, we were watching people trying to walk through the altar to try and get near it, and they were just getting taken out under the anointing. I remember in one meeting that we were worshipping God and the presence of God was there and I watched the musicians get up to come and play because they thought this is the time now we're supposed to sing. And I thought, this doesn't seem right. And as, the, as they walked up, the Holy Spirit took them all out like ten pin bowls, just wiped them all out. And I thought, well, maybe God didn't want any singing just now, you know. <laughs> See, our life is to be a living sacrifice, an act of worship. Singing is one part of it. The danger is that we actually worship music rather than worship God. It's another five center. So I stood there and I thought, God, this is it. You can be taken up. You can be transformed. You can see the glory of God. And so as a new believer, I remember walking in, coming into the anointing of God, coming sometimes walking towards the front of the church, and the whole church would disappear, and I could see the new heavens. And where I got slain in the spirit there, my spirit, God said, come in. And so by revelation, God took me into different parts of that. And we only see in part. We see little bits. You know what I mean? People say, oh, be very careful. You know, you're talking, my angel speaks to you. Or, you know what I mean? Well, I'm preaching Christ crucified and I have for the last 24 years. But my understanding of God is that I need to come into his presence. You know where Jesus is? He's in heaven. You know what he looks like? I've seen him. He's glorified. You know what comes forth from him? Love, peace, joy, comfort. What radiates out of him? Anointing and empowering, commissioning. And we are born for such a time as this. Esther was born for a time as what Mordecai said, you've been born for such a time as this. She was, through fasting and prayer, encouraged to go in and see the king. In doing that, he was sitting upon his throne. She could have lost her life because she had not been asked by the king to enter. But she boldly came in. The king extended his golden scepter towards her. She touched it, and the king said, you can have up to half the kingdom, Esther. Do you realize that we have a king of kings sitting upon the throne in heaven? He also has a golden scepter. All authority. Not half of it. All authority. The entire kingdom can be given. Do you realize the authority that wants to come is not from man, it's from God. 
Do you realize that men who understand the presence of God understand people who carry the authority of God? Some people in their insecurity are frightened by it. Other people actually respect it and honor it. That leadership respect comes out of the authority that Christ has given to his servants who have paid the price and counted the cost. And kneel before him and cast like the elders did their crowns before his throne. And go, he is God. Who are we? But in that place, as the old knights of old used to come before their kings, they'd get assignments, they'd get standards, they'd get seals, they'd get weapons. Realize the king, king in the natural days in the UK used to bring out weaponry and open his armory and start giving some of his best armor to his knights. And see, God himself begins giving us weapons that come directly from him. Sword of the Spirit. There are other things. There's actually javelins. There's also war axes. There's different things used for different battles, war clubs. You'd be shocked to find it's not just Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18, talking about the sword of the Spirit. There's a few other things there that you can get through Revelation. How many know you don't open a door if you need to get through it with a sword? You pick the lock with it? War club would kind of help kick the thing in, wouldn't it? Just a thought. Anyhow. We are to be citizens of heaven. We are to be coming into that what's called unapproachable light, but we can approach the light through the grace and the glory of God's love shed by his precious blood. We can enter in and start getting transformed. We can start to see and understand the mysteries that are given to the believers, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Seek first, what? The kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of what? Kingdom of heaven. Seek that first. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven be given to those who are believers. The Bible says, knock and the door shall be opened to you. What door are you knocking on? Heaven's door? Jesus said, I am the door. Do you understand the door into that realm is through him alone. No one can come in apart from him. Jesus also said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of earth. Matthew 16, verse 9, I've given you keys to the kingdom of heaven. What are keys used to do? Unlock doors. Into where? People say, well, don't get so spiritual, you know, earthly good. Well, my scripture tells me that you're not actually good unless you actually do get spiritual. My Bible says, don't focus upon the things of earth. Set your mind upon things of heaven. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Set your minds on things above, not on the things of earth. We're to be sons and daughters of light. Think, think about the eternal things, not the temporary things. Eternal things, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18, are the things that will remain throughout eternity. The kingdom of heaven. And it's not the Hollywood version. The kingdom of heaven. you realize that the, the, the powers of darkness understand what God's doing? It's called the return of the king. The two towers. Some of you get it. Honor a prophet and you receive a prophet's reward. I'll close with one, one, one thing. You can change the world. One man was, a, was an Ethiopian eunuch in, in um, Jeremiah 38, I think it is. He saved Jeremiah out of a, out of a dry well, which would have killed him. Jeremiah was spared, and, and this Ethiopian eunuch was the person who actually helped him. What was so amazing is that as he risked his life to honor the prophet, because the scriptures say if you honor a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. Jeremiah 38, verse 10, we read in Acts about another Ethiopian eunuch who changed the nation. In Acts chapter 8, it says he was reading the scripture Philip on this chariot, and an Ethiopian eunuch gets the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you realize in Ethiopia, the first century church still exists? It's called the Coptic. Do you realize in Egypt, over 10 million Christians still exist? It's called the Coptic Egyptian church. 10 million. How many? 10 million. More Christians there than there are in New Zealand, South Africa, and Australia must be put together. And we have no idea. Right in the middle of the Middle East, the entire Middle East in the first century, the whole of Egypt was saved in the first century. Two-thirds of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Christian. You realize that most of the mosques in the Middle East are actually churches? 
realize the biggest church in Constantinople, which is now modern-day Istanbul, is the Church of St. Sophia, which is now called the Blue Mosque. If you walk inside it and look up the mosaics from the first century Christians, that is the biggest church in the world. It rivaled, actually, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Do you realize the Christians defaced most of the Egyptian temples because they realized that in the Ankh, the key of life, was eternity. They put the cross inside it. They understand that Jesus Christ is the key to life. They used all the temples then as places to worship God and to, and to uh, love the Lord. For the first six centuries, and for particularly the first four, Egypt was the center of Christian learning out of Alexandria for many, many, many centuries. So how can you change a nation? How can you change a world? Come in through revelation into the person of Jesus Christ. Get the commissioning and calling from him. Allow him through servant-hearted leadership by submitting to the apostles, which the scriptures did in Acts chapter 6, they went out as servants and they reached the world. If you honor prophets, you get a prophet's reward. If you honor someone who carries the anointing of a prophet or prophetess, you can actually bless a nation. You can also incur the judgment of God upon a nation. Right now, being back in New Zealand, I feel New Zealand's on the edge of the judgment of God. First time in 24 years of being an animal New Zealander right on the edge of the judgment of God. Most of us don't even have a clue how close that is. Let's pray. So Father, I thank you that by the power of your spirit that you bring personal revelation, that you set our minds upon things of heaven, and that Lord, you dwell in the heavenly realm, that you love us, that you die that we might be forgiven, that we might have access into your throne room. Lord, I pray this morning that you would just ignite a hunger and passion in people's hearts to come into the realm of personal revelation, that they would begin to knock upon that door. They'll begin to use keys that you've given them to unlock the mysteries of heaven. As believers, as disciples of Christ, they would begin to hunger and thirst after you, Lord, and the fullness of your glory, that they might be seated with you, that they might be transformed by you, that they might know the love and the grace that surpasses understanding. Now, Father, where they've failed and where they've fallen, that you could come and cleanse them, bringing your purity and holiness back into their hearts. And I pray that they would have an ability to know that they can come without fear to you, the true light of the world. And Father, there's nothing that can separate them from that love, neither life nor death, principality or power. Nothing can separate them from the love that's in your Son, Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that today, that your glory wants to come into our house, into our temple, to transform us. That we might know the call, the high call, that's upon those who have inherited eternal salvation through Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to make opportunity for anyone who has never given their heart to the Lord. In every meeting, there are people who have come who have either never been saved, never received Jesus as their Savior. He is the risen, glorified, Holy One of God. And He will forgive you. There are others that I know in churches that have failed and sinned and backslidden and feel absolutely beyond hope and feel as though they could never again come back into that presence of purity and holiness. And I know that God can forgive and cleanse and purify again and again and again and again. No matter how many times you fall, no matter how many times, his heart's there when people are repentant to cleanse and purify. It's like us all just to stand and as we just sing in closing, like those who've never given their heart to Jesus or have fallen away for whatever reason, just to make their way to the front of the church that we can pray with you. That you could once again lift up your hands and bow your knee before him, the Son of God. If you're afraid to come, you come with a friend and just say, look, I, am, I know God's drawing me. God's speaking to me. I need to get right with him. I need to know that my sins are forgiven. I need to know the love and grace of God again. Let's just sing as you bring your friends and make your way to the front this morning.